Over 50 people were killed in fierce fighting between two militias in Libya's capital, Tripoli. What led to this sudden outbreak? A new report has revealed the extent of the crackdown by Indonesian forces on indigenous villages in West Papua. What caused this crackdown and what was its impact? And a controversy is brewing in the US after a soldier allegedly defected to North Korea. What is this all about? This is the Daily Debrief. These are our stories for the day. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We begin with Libya, where fighting broke out on Monday between two militias loyal to the same government. The 444 Brigade and the Special Deterrence Force of the SDF fought over the detention of the commander of the brigade by the SDF. Late after mediation, the commander Mahmoud Hamza was released. Both these militias report to the Government of National Unity, which itself is one of the two governments in the country. While large-scale fighting has not taken place in Libya for a couple of years, the country's political crisis has continued. We go to Abdul for more. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, curious and in fact deadly situation in Libya, warfare in Tripoli killing over 50 people, the death count is 55 I believe. So before we go into the larger situation which led to this, why are two militias which are affiliated to the same government fighting? Uh, as per the reports for the local media, whatever reports are available because we know that the condition in which Libya is since 2011, it is difficult to verify the exact uh, news. But whatever reports are available in the media, uh, according to that, the the special uh, deterrence forces, one of the militias affiliated to Abdul Hamid Demelba government, which is called the uh, Government of National Accord, uh, National Unity, uh, basically arrested uh, one of the uh, uh, commanders or the commander of another militia, uh, and which basically when he was trying to uh, go out of uh, Tripoli, going to Misrata for an official on an official mission to discuss certain matters, it seems there is a negotiations, different rounds of parallel negotiations going on between different sections of uh, militias which are ruling Libya at this moment. And at that moment, because of the disagreement over this, whether the talk should proceed the way it should be, they arrested uh, the leader of one of the militias. And that the, the other militia retaliated uh, against it, which led to uh, uh, violence in Tripoli, different parts of Tripoli, for um, almost two days continued, uh, despite the fact that the, on Tuesday uh, uh, afternoon, it was, it was announced that the, uh, the, the commander which was arrested, who was arrested, has been released. Despite that news breaking out, the fight did not end. And uh, the fight went on in different uh, localities all across Tripoli. The, uh, the civilian airport had to be uh, shut for a while. Uh, the flights had to be diverted and all and so on and so forth. By the way, this is nothing new. Uh, uh, Tripoli has uh, witnessed such kind of fights between all militias loyal to one particular government. The fact that there are two different governments in uh, Libya at this moment. Uh, the, so the militias within one government are fighting against each other. And this is, uh, at least this year, this is the third major incident. There are other instances uh, which has happened uh, uh, in which, again, dozens of people uh, were killed on all those occasions. And it seems that all those disagreements, the militias with, with guns and all the firepower they have, instead of sitting together and resolving their differences, they prefer to use their guns to resolve their differences. And this is exactly what is happening in Libya uh, for the last uh, more than a decade now. Right, Abdul, in this context, uh, let's go into the larger picture, which is that, this, like you said, this is only one government, the government of national unity. But there's also another government led by another prime minister, two power centers. And, uh, you know, while, like you said, there's probably been no large scale fighting over the past couple of years, but there have been small clashes. And so why exactly are there two governments and why is there no political resolution yet? Uh, well, uh, as I said before, since 2011, NATO led intervention in Libya, which basically uh, 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 led to the fall of the Daphne government and completely broke the stability with which the Libya was uh, known for, for decades. Uh, 
the different militias trying to control over uh, have to have larger control over the country's resources particularly the oil resources fought against each other uh, uh, continue to fight against each other but finally in 2020 uh, un was able to intervene and kind of there was a ceasefire agreed in which uh, there was an interim government form the baba is the was the interim prime minister he his government had a mandate that by end of 2021 there will be an election uh, in libya and a new government uh, uh, will come up, uh, come up but that of course uh, the baba government failed to do it again because of the disagreements among all the parties which participated in the un led discussion and because of that the libyan parliament which is based in one of the eastern cities uh, uh, tabruk uh, in uh, libya uh, completely came out of uh, the so called go- interim government and said that we do not recognize the legitimacy of the baba government and they basically establish a new government this government uh, uh, the, they tried to control uh, tripoli again and that led to uh, another set of clashes minor clashes of course not at the scale at which libya was uh, uh, before the ceasefire in 2020 and that uh, new government finally decided after failing thrice uh, to kind of enter tripoli and c- get control over it finally decided to have a new base in sur so there are two governments one supported by the libyan parliament based in sur and one government supported uh, called interim government basically supported by a presidential council this is a remnant of a earlier parliament which came out in libya in 2014 so uh, you can see there is a very complex situation and but the primary reason for the difference between all those forces is who will have the larger control and greater say over the country's resources and this basically and who is backed by which external power so there are of course the uh, ex- involvements of us and other european countries like france heavily involved trying to have a greater control over the resources in libya backing a particular section of militia there but uh, there are people who are also and, and the regional countries were also trying to assert uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, role in libya's politics and that basically has led to a complete chaos in libya libya is a uh, ruled by as we uh, discussed already there are two major governments but also there are reasons in the southern uh, libya which are ruled by other tribal affiliated uh, militias so it is a complete chaos primarily created by the nato led uh, intervention which basically broke all the uh, truce which was there under gaddafi's mm-hmm. regime Well, Abdul, thank you so much for that analysis uh, looks like like you said the underlying issues stemming from the nato invasion and the complete failure there after the complete chaos that is uh, broken out and to this day people in libya are suffering from that we'll come back to you on other stories soon a new report by a rights advocacy group has documented gruesome and indiscriminate violence by indonesian security forces in the militarized region of west papua the report was released on august 17th by a germany based group called human rights monitor it focuses on indonesia and west papua the report documented massive civilian destruction in the region because of the ongoing violence between west papua nationalists and indonesian forces with over 2000 people displaced we speak to anish about the report and the recent developments in the region anish thank you so much for joining us now we have talked on the show and written about west papua and people's dispatch before but for the benefit of our viewers could you maybe explain the context of the violence which this report has documented yeah so the current uh, spate of violence that we've seen uh kind of began in about december 2018 when uh, you know nationalist west papua nationalist actually uh, and militants especially uh, attacked uh, as a you know a construction site and killed about a dozen more than a dozen people uh, mostly workers of that and uh, this pretty much uh, began the spate of violence but um, you know the intensity uh, that we are looking at right now uh, pretty much began after uh, the 2019 protest anti racist protest that students not just in west papua but also in different parts of indonesia took out uh, on august 15th which was also the day when the new york agreement uh, was signed basically which gave uh, indonesia control and you know 
uh, power over uh, West Papua after the Dutch uh, uh, the Dutch actually left. So this sort of situation, uh, ever since then, we have seen violence. Uh, and this uh, pretty much it began with uh, riots and, uh, you know, anti papuan violence that we saw in different parts of the country, especially in Jaipura. Uh, and then uh, followed by police repression and the police repression gave way to a new set of protests that went on for months, actually. Uh, in September, at the, uh, it was a peak in September, at least in Jaipura, which was the West Papuan capital at the time. And uh, this uh, repression actually uh, soon uh, made way for the violent repression at the time. And obviously the riots that followed displaced a large number of people and the violence uh, created like it created more uh, militancy at the time, which in turn was uh, met with higher levels of militarization by the Indonesian government, hundreds of Indonesian troops were poured into the region, which was already uh, facing a, uh, you know, a kind of sustained level of violence for decades at that point. So this uh, pretty much created a situation where West Papua was not only militarized, but it was also pretty much cut off from the rest of the world. Uh, journalists, international journalists especially, uh, need to get special permits to enter the region. Uh, all of the six provinces right now, and uh, and uh, in many cases, at times when violence are, are actually at its peak, you have internet shutdowns, prolonged internet shutdowns, and any kind of you know broadcasting shutdowns even uh, that pretty much uh, limit any information that goes out of the region. So, and this obviously is coupled with violence because every time we see like uh, there is some kind of revelation, a video comes out. Uh, of, uh, you know, armed forces uh, indiscriminately firing at uh, civilians, uh, it clearly shows that the violence has never really ebbed. And this report only pretty much outlines the the, the, uh, the intensity of this violence. It clearly shows how uh, in the, uh, the documentation is pretty much based since mid-2021 to uh, 2022, and it shows how, and it pre estimates how not only fatalities doubled, it went from 20, 21 in 2021 to 48 in 2022, but the number of uh, people who were displaced because of the violent destruction that uh, that was carried out by the military in their bid to uh, subdue the militants clearly created a, a, a more or less a humanitarian uh, you know, crisis of its own, uh, even though at a smaller scale than we see in different parts of the world, but definitely a massive problem for uh, people of West Papua. And also, Anish, are there any more contemporary developments regarding this? Any process of negotiation that has taken place, you know, or it being raised in international fora, something like that? Well, there have been uh, multiple attempts by neighbors, the Pacific neighbors uh, of Indonesia trying to raise this issue, especially the island nations and at times uh, New Zealand and Australia as well, talking about uh, raising this issue. Uh, last year, we had uh, uh, about more than two dozen uh, Pacific uh, nations bringing up this matter at the United Nations General Assembly calling for, uh, you know, significant scrutiny on Indonesia over its record, its human rights record in the region. So there is that, definitely. There is also a certain level of international pressure, but it's very subdued because very often the news about West Papua doesn't really reach as much in the mainstream uh, uh, media unless it's a major incident or something particularly gruesome, as we recently did about the, uh, the torture and mutilation of four uh, West Papuans uh, and the case uh, uh, around it and the conviction of soldiers on the matter. Uh, but uh, definitely the repression continues. Uh, earlier this week, we actually saw again on the August 15th when there was a demonstration, a protest demonstration in Jayapura being violently dispersed by the police with tear gas and, and you know, multiple uh, detentions. Again, we do not get much information about this. Uh, primarily because uh, foreign media is not uh, allowed. That is apart from the fact that even national media, even Indonesian journalists are not really allowed uh, without uh, being vetted uh, by the military itself. So there is a constant state of, apart from militarization, there's a constant state of being under military rule that is quite dis different from what uh, Indonesians elsewhere, uh, you know, kind of has to deal with. And this creates a situation where information is very uh, rare. You 
get that definitely it's not like you can completely shut down information from flowing out but it is quite rare for that information to actually come in and for that to be even credible in some cases and so it becomes a big task and definitely there's no attempt by the government at least from the joko jokovic government that we've seen so far there were obviously very recently we spoke about how the indonesian government uh, uh you know is begin a reparations process for past crimes but um, almost nothing was mentioned about west papua uh, and you know any of the crimes that were committed in the west papua region because obviously this government was leading this violent uh, anti militant uh, anti insurgency campaign and this has created a situation where uh, i mean if you look at the report it's quite significant about 200 structures including churches houses entire villages about at least eight villages were raised to the ground and 2000 or two, uh, 2200 or more uh, of uh, papuans being completely displaced and there being no there being no shelter for them obviously and they have to take refuge in the forest this is like quite a very star, dark picture that we're looking at and that is very rarely being uh, you know very rarely receives attention outside of the pacific in most cases Right. Uh, thank you so much, Anish, for talking to us and stay back because we'll come back to you for another story. And finally, a very curious story. A U.S. soldier is apparently defected to North Korea. Travis King reportedly crossed into North Korean territory in July in an action that the U.S. military described as willful and without authorization. Now, North Korea says that King came to the country due to, and I quote, inhuman maltreatment and racial discrimination in the U.S. Army. What is this all about? We go back to Anish. Thanks for coming back, Anish. So, a very curious story, this a story of a U.S. soldier defecting to North Korea happened in July, of course. A lot of confusion, lack of clarity. Uh, so, first, could you maybe take us to the exact developments? What happened? How did this uh, U.S. soldier, obviously belonging you know, to a very uh, professional military force, so to speak, suddenly vanishes off to North Korea? Well, the incident itself, at the time that it happened, it much created a sensation itself. Because obviously this was not a situation, obviously the US uh, and its media houses try to portray it as some kind of uh, illegal detention. They try to make it as some sort of uh, a situation where the soldier was kidnapped uh, uh, at, uh, in whatever way. I mean, like that was pretty much the language that we saw at the time. And they were trying to raise this issue in different international forums as if the soldier's life was threatened. Uh, but uh, there was a lot of confusion on how things uh, came about. There were multiple uh, accounts, even eyewitness accounts. In some cases, uh, some people said that there were no soldiers at the DMZ, the demilitarized zone that pretty much uh, separates North and South Korea. And uh, at the time that he ran through the border, which is quite rare, it doesn't really happen in that area, we know that. Uh, and some even say that he uh, looked back at the people and just said ha 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 and uh, you know ran into the ran into North Korea before being apprehended by uh, North Korean uh, soldiers. So this uh, situation was quite clear in many ways. It like it wasn't something that we were expecting, uh, and uh, nobody was sure if it was defection for sure. But uh, at the time, like with the data that we had at the time, many had assumed. This was a defection, and now it is confirmed by the North Korean authorities that this man is trying to defect to North Korea or an, another country uh, altogether. Uh, at the time of the reporting, like at the time of the incident, there were multiple accounts from the family as well about how uh, he was uh, not having a great time with the military. He was facing racial discrimination. Uh, he had uh, severe mental health issues that the military was not uh, taking into account, he was uh, charged with assault of two civilians in South Korea. Again, something not uncommon for the soldiers to do in South Korea. This is not something that is new, uh, but this is definitely being done by a black man. And uh, that definitely, probably that ra racial aspect of it uh, comes into play. And the fact that he has raised this uh, fact that he is facing racism and racial discrimination in the military at, to the North Korean authorities clearly shows that there was something far more significant than what we have been let on so far. Well, Anish, I believe this has also led to some discussion, at least in the US, about the issue of racism in the military itself. So what is being talked about there? Well, the, the discussion is quite muted, to be very honest. There is definitely reports about it, but nobody really wants to make a statement, a very categorical statement so far. 
uh, from uh, what we can assume is that in a few days we might see extensive extrapolation of his criminal records, the fact that he was detained in South Korea for two months for assault, for assault charges and was, uh, you know, awaiting uh, to be sent back to the United States to be court-martialed. Uh, all of that aside, we are also looking at a system uh, which is quite, uh, you know, where racial disparity is pretty much system myth. Uh, we are looking at, uh, despite the fact that uh, more than 20% of uh, U.S. military personnel are African-Americans, there is a significant concentration of these African-American or even colored personnel at the lower ranks of, you know, soldier ranks of uh, the U.S. military, almost uh, very rare for them to reach into specialized uh, professions like being a pilot or, or, you know, getting into Air Force or Navy. And uh, and the higher ranks being completely almost completely uh, dominated by white men, like the fact that they are now talking about uh, getting a new uh, uh, African American or black uh, general and a black uh, chief of staff in the coming months uh, shows that in this almost two hundred years of history, uh, there was pretty much no attempt to for them to be you know to actually ele to elevate to that position. Apart from that, we have also reports, like past reports, and this is before even Travis King actually happened, this was in 2017, when there were reports of how, uh, you know, black soldiers were more likely to be court-martialed and convicted of their court-martial charges uh, by the military than white soldiers. We have seen uh, the rates are quite stark, like we see 70% chances of them being court-martialed in the Air Force, where they're already a smaller percentage of the uh, of the personnel, uh, about sixty percent in the army, uh, they are far more likely to be court-martialed, uh, like more than twice as likely to be court-martialed uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, which is the fourth uh, kind of uh, integrated force that mostly uh, operate outside of the U.S. Uh, and in all of these cases, uh, the the discussion from then has not really significantly moved forward, uh, and changes have not happened. Uh, even though multiple, uh, you know, statements have been made by political leaders, uh, the Senate members, and even the military about trying to diversify, the diversification is pretty much happening on the lower rungs of the military, where you have more and more likelihood of uh, your average soldier being uh, a non-white person than them becoming an officer who actually takes charge of the situation. So this uh, this is something that is very rarely talked about, and the fact that it it came out like that. Is pretty much a big, massive damage to U.S. military's reputation, not just because of the racial disparity, but also the fact that it clearly shows that it has created a situation where somebody had to defect to another country, uh, you know, seek a refuge in a country that is considered a U.S. enemy uh, in all sense of the word uh, we can think of, uh, and that really damages its reputation to that great extent. I believe. Right. Thank you so much, Anish, for speaking to us. And that's all we have in today's episode of Daily Debrief. Do keep visiting our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on YouTube, all the social media platforms where you can see stories from across the world, stories of people's movements, stories of geopolitical interest. And if you haven't hit that subscribe button already, please do.